before. However, the, the construction of the world itself, the, 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 the literary universe that I'm writing, uh, required a I really think the person who got me started on world building as a literary exercise was Annie McCaffrey and Hearn. Because I remember when I read Hearn having the sense, I read uh, Dragonfly. And, and the, one, the original analog. The original analog, uh, in analog, in serial form. And I remember thinking that there was a whole world under that story, even though she hadn't told you all about it. There was a sense of continuity, a sense that what she had told you about were individual facets of a much bigger mosaic that existed. A lot of fantasy writers, their entire fantasy world is about the size of Connecticut when you get into variations in flora and fauna and societies and how the governments are set up. I'm a historian, okay? And one of the things that historians become aware of if they're serious about being historians is at any given moment, the world is a damn big place. And it's real easy to get focused in on what was happening in Europe in the ninth century and not be paying a whole lot of attention to what happened in China in the ninth century. You can even get away with not worrying too much about what's happening down there around the Mediterranean if you're studying, you know, Scandinavian history. But there's a lot of stuff going down there around the Mediterranean that's going to make big problems not too much further down the road. And a fellow named Clovis is going to have a little problem in France someday real soon now in a historical sense. Well, all worlds are like that. And if you're going to build a world to set a novel in, or a short story in, you have to be aware of the fact that there's a whole world behind the story that you're going to tell. There are things in the tech bible you may not believe this, given my proclivity to explain things to people, but, but there are a great many things in the Tech Bible that I have never gotten around to mentioning to anyone and saw no particular reason to mention to anyone because they didn't play a major factor in one of the stories that I was telling. But they've always been there. And because they have, I've written with a, uh, a continuity that is real, that is apparent to the reader, even if they don't know what it is I haven't told them. Does that make sense? It's kind of like when I say Honor Harrington is a different person to everyone who has ever met her in a book because you come to it with different expectations. And in a sense, you have a different interchange with her, a different exchange with her. Every single person does. But what matters is that even if I don't know the character exactly the same way that you know the character, I continue to write her the way that I know her. And that gives a continuity to your acquaintance with her. You take each new thing I have her do, and you fit that into the relationship that you have with her already. I explain it sometimes by saying, OK, to Megan Morgan and Michael, I'm daddy. Okay, to Sharon, I'm that guy who steals blankets in the middle of the night. Um, to the members of my church, I'm, uh, I'm a lay speaker. To you guys, I'm a science fiction author. I'm different people to everybody who knows me. All right? And so is a character in a novel. Right. Uh, but there has to be that cohesion that sense of this is the same person, this is the same world. Now, when you set out to build a literary world, the first thing you have to do is think about what story do you want to tell, what kind of story. 
Uh, when I started to do the Honorverse, I originally started to think in terms of uh, uh, Rome and uh, the, the uh, Carthage, Roman Carthage, and, and the Punic War. Um, the problem was that that was essentially uh, a story between a uh, land power which became a naval power and conquered a naval power. Okay, but the really decisive aspects of that war, in many ways, were the ones that were fought out in Italy during Hannibal's campaign, where patrician finally got the better of it, and the, the Romans finally figured out, we know what to do when we run into military genius. We go home and recruit another army and come back and keep coming back until the military genius runs out of troops. Okay. Um, so I decided to go, you know, a lot of people think that you have a, this is partly deliberate on my part, the same way that I wanted you to be thinking Napoleon in a certain you know, Admiral Cluster Bob came along. Um, people think, okay, this was the, the Napoleonic Wars. It's not, it's the Anglo-Dutch Wars in a lot of ways because both sides live or die by their naval power, all right? If you lose the naval war, your planets are helpless, all right? So both, in that sense, even, it's not a battle between a land power and a naval power, it's a battle between two maritime powers, but it's two maritime powers with different objectives. So there is some French in there because the, the, the Havenites are really more of the kind of um, gear de course and um, the Navy exists to achieve the strategic mission of the Army is almost part of their thinking, although it's the Navy all the way through, whereas the Manticorans think more in terms of the classic exercise of, of maritime power, commerce, commerce protection, commerce denial, etc. So there are in a good world, in a good world, you don't simply file the serial numbers off of a, off of a historical period and give them different names, and you're good to go. Now that can work if you know your Roman history well. You can read a, uh, a Dominic Landry novel and know which emperor you're dealing with <laughs> for Roman history. I mean, you really can. And if you know your Byzantine history and you read uh, Harry Turtledove's Medessa cycle, the same thing is true. It doesn't keep them from being thumping good stories, but for the most part, one of the reasons that Medessa works is that so few people in America know squat about Byzantine history. It's why the Belisarius series, the general series, works so well for David Drake, too. It's like, Belisarius, who's he? Nobody had ever heard of it. Uh, so first you have to decide this is the kind of story I'm going to tell, therefore this is the kind of world I need in which to tell the story. Then you have to think about what is the level in this world at which I'm going to tell the story. Am I going to be here at the grand strategic level am I going to tell that story? And maybe have characters who are fighting out the, the, the conflict. This is where I am. Or do I want to kind of ignore this part and tell it from the viewpoint of somebody in a trench on the Western Front who could care less uh, about what the, the detailed foreign policy of his government is and a lot more about where the next gas shell is going to land and whether or not he'll get to his gas mask in time. So, you know, which kind of story do I want to tell? That then tells you what level of the world needs to be most fully developed before you start writing. Uh, you have to think about, okay, the character is going to be my viewpoint character. And you may think about this for more than one viewpoint character, maybe one on each side. You have to think about who you want that character to be, what you want that character to be, and then building a world that will permit that character to be who and what you need him or her to be. Uh, so, I knew that I wanted a, uh, a naval officer. I knew 
you that I want that the naval officer who had risen to her rank uh, on the basis of merit. Uh, I knew that I wanted her to have uh, uh, enemies who would be able to use positions of power and privilege uh, to hamper her along the way. And that suggested to me that I needed either uh, an aristocratic system or I needed one in which you had a corrupted representative political structure where the safeguards that would have prevented that kind of abuse of power could be circumvented or didn't exist. And so I decided I could have it both ways. I could put her in an aristocratic society and make her a non-aristocrat. And for the opponent, I could have a corrupted representative system in which people were able to use privilege and power uh, frivolously without penalty because the system was sufficiently far gone that that would happen. Um, you have to decide whether you're going to write science fiction, historical fiction, or fantasy. If you're going to write historical fiction, you have to be aware that that's going to place constraints upon who and what your character can be. Honor Harrington could not have been a frigate captain in the War of 1812. Homer Harrington could have been. But Honor Harrington couldn't have been. Okay. Um, so, and, you know, you can write fantasy. But again, my feeling is if you're going to write fantasy in which you have a kick butt heroine, you got to explain how that kick butt five foot four heroine is able to kick butt on six foot two barbarian hunts. Okay. Either that or you cheat and you make her a very tall uh, fantasy world heroine, like, oh, I don't know, uh, Leanna in the Bazell novels, who is six foot three, for God's sake, okay? <laughs> and, and she found a husband to make her feel petite, you know? And it's like, that's the real reason she fell for a horse dealer for not <laughs> Yeah, but she's tired towering around a wall to dinner. Um, Honor Harrington is you know, six feet two. Um, and um, anyway, Alba is six three which is why Merlin could possibly be female. I didn't originally intend to make Nimue that tall because I'm sensing a motif here, uh, but I, I need to have a reason why her pica could be a woman other than simply the society didn't allow for women to be in the roles that she was in. Um, and the problem is that the average height of a, of a say, holy male is about five foot eight. Okay, they tend taller than northern, you know, extreme northern and extreme southern kingdoms the same way that they do in the Scandinavian But I mean, still, six feet three would make her one of the 2% tallest men on the planet. All right, and as a woman, nobody, she wouldn't have been able to be unremarked wherever she went, let's put it that way. Um, so you have to be thinking in terms of, um, how do I make this character work in that universe? All right, well, in Honor's case, somebody called me the first post-feminist science fiction author. A reviewer did several years ago. I was like, what the hell is the first post-feminist science fiction author? And I finally figured out what she was getting at. There is no glass ceiling in the Honor person. Women in the uh, no matter, all of Honor's enemies, all the people who think she doesn't make a good officer, and she's uppity, and all the rest of it, nobody thinks that she shouldn't be an officer because she's a woman. That just doesn't even come into play until she gets Grayson. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't people like uh, a certain Pablo Young uh, who have less enlightened views of gender equality, but the thing that you have to understand about Pablo is Pavel regarded everyone in the same sense that he regarded Honor as somebody who was put there for his convenience, okay? And uh, so for him, it definitely was not simply a matter of, it wasn't a sexuality matter. It was a putting you in your place matter as far as she was, and it was because she was female, it was because she was a commoner who hadn't kowtowed to him sufficiently. All right. 
But then I'm going to have my game Grayson, where you have the, the, the people who are grappling with it. But I thought, well, okay, that's fair enough, you know. Um, it never occurred to me to not make honor Athena. I did not set out to say, well, I'm going to write a female naval officer for those people aren't doing that. That will be cool and it will get me a lot of people. Um, I always knew that her last that her first name was going to be Honor and she was going to be female. Um, I realized that if the series succeeded, she would ultimately be compared to Horatio Warren Blower. So I said, what the hell, let's go for it. And, and made her Harrington, you know. Um, and I thought the name had a good feel to it. Um, but in terms of considering whether to make her male or female, never came into the, into the question, into, into my mind at all. Um, so you built your, you, you decided this is the kind of story you want to tell. You decided these are the kinds of cultures you're going to need to populate with in order to tell the story you want to tell. This is the kind of society you're going to need for your character to fit in to tell the kind of story you want to tell. All right. You're a fair way towards building your world at this point. But you still kind of have to, there are two ways you can proceed for it. One, you can write, start writing the story and expect to fill in the details as you go along. Okay? You're going along and your character comes to the point where his buddy's starship just blew up. Okay? And you know he's not going to say Shucky Dogs. Alright? So at that point you have to decide, is this character religious? Ooh, do we have a monotheistic or a polytheistic religion, assuming we have a religion at all? Ooh, if we have a polytheistic religion, which deity does this character follow? Ooh, if we have a polytheistic deity, if this is the deity, how, how does she or she feel about taking that deity's name in vain? Okay, kind of thing. So you can either do that, build the, the pantheon ahead of time, or hope that when you get there, you'll get the notes written down so that you don't forget it the next time around. I have found that it is much wiser to write it down the first time. Um, and that way you have much less explaining to do to the readers who say, but on page 13 in book 47, <laughs> the fourth paragraph, the second sentence, three words from the end, you said, you know, and it's the only time you said it, so you made a continuity error. And you say, well, no, it's a typo. I said, but you said Zeus instead of Hera. How could that be a typo? Well, it was just, you know, I kind of flipped them mentally, you know, Zeus, Hera, they didn't get along. <laughs> and, 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 and they're like, yeah, right. I have to say that, uh, what was it? Galaxy oh, Quest? Oh, no. Yeah, I, I was like, oh boy, I so sympathized with the <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, because I, fandom is great, okay? But you will meet the AC, the, 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 the anal retentive fan, okay? Who will search diligently through the book and find one sentence and that sentence proves that what really happened was this and usually the sentence is taken out of context uh, but kind of i've met theologians who are very good at this <laughs> okay if you have a good concordance you can find a spot in scripture that will say anything you wanted to say now to make it say what you want to say, you may have to take it totally out of context. Okay. But you can do it if you really put your mind to it. And I've got readers who have done that to me, you know. Um, I've had readers who have killed countless photons uh, trying to convince me that frigates are the ideal ship in the universe. <laughs> and you go, no, they're not. You know, and he said, yeah, they are. And it's a sign that I built the world right, that somebody is willing to argue with me 
about, you know, well, you know, by the standards of your own technology, you know, we can do this, we can do that, therefore we should do this. And you're like, Graph oh, lands. Beg your pardon? Graph lands. <laughs> Don't go there. No. Well, actually, the graph lens is, was not a brand new weapon when science developed it. At that point, super dreadnoughts mounted graph lenses. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, no, the graph lens was the new system, but they mounted the, um, the, the, the energy torpedoes as a close range finish you off after the sidewall goes down uh, weapon system. Uh, and they simply, you know, fell out of favor as the ranges continued to increase in, in missile combat. So it's like, okay, fine. But the grab lens is a freaking engineering system, okay? You got to gut the ship to fit it in. Uh, so it's ever had a long time ago with a conversation about how to use the grab lens. Yeah, I did. They went, they went tree cat marines <laughs> and hyper-capable frigates armed with grab lance. <laughs> <laughs> what they really like is a hyper-capable fighter armed with a grab lance. Tree cats are small, so you can downsize everything, you know, <laughs> except the power plant. <laughs> you know? So the, the, uh, <coughs> we use data alerts for use on our account. Okay, I know we're not in the whole bundle of life. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there the grab lens is one of those one of those items. Um, there's also a problem that so the safe hold ones, for example, this is a problem that has come up several times in the session on far. I have a very clear vision in my mind of exactly where safe holds actual technology is before honor, I mean, before, before Merlin comes on the scene. Okay. There's an assumption on the part of a lot of the readership that because firearms were approximately where they were at the end of the Tudor period, that you're dealing with uh, essentially units of equal levels of technology across the board. You are not. Okay. Firearms are a relatively recent development on race. And as such, they are much more primitive than the general level of sophistication of race. I was just going to say, sorry. Uh, when you have enough literary worlds around, around, that's another problem you get into. <laughs> Uh, three! <laughs> uh, but you get into, uh, for example, there's a canning industry on St. Louis, okay? There's a reference in, in at least one of the books, I think, about shrimp in a jar, okay? Um, there's pasteurization, and they don't know how, why it works, but it's there. There is a very Yes, you told me you uh, There are, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of capabilities in specific areas of technology that you would not associate with Elizabethan technology because it's not Elizabethan technology. It is extremely advanced technology which has been provided to these people without explanation of how it works and restricted them to muscle and water power. Their ships have iron tanks yeah. to stow the water instead of with casks, which has a huge, huge bearing on the health of the crews. The crews, the Pasquale's law dictates that they eat a balanced diet, all right? They know how to do preserved foods. They have, uh, uh, public hygiene and sanitation codes that are 20th century at least, even though they have to be applied without electrical or internal combustion or steam power. So there's all this sophistication out there that the reader misses if he persists in thinking of this world as having Elizabethan level technology. And that is one of the reasons that Merlin and Houseman and Caleb and Charlie on and Baron Sina 
can advance at the rate that they're advancing, once that can, once Pandora's box gets open and it's okay to ask why this works, and there's somebody who suggests, well, you know, if you combine this technique that we already had and that technique that we already had, and you add an open hearth furnace to the equation, interesting things will happen. Okay. And, and, and we get into it, there was just a debate about um, liberating the concentration camps in Cinemark. You know, we got to, it's a moral imperative to send the force around to liberate the concentration camp, arm the inmates, and then they can at least die fighting. Well, the problem is the concentration camps are 700, 800, 1,000 miles behind the lines. And yes, it's a very sophisticated, in many ways, but they still use horses for the cavalry, okay? Uh, and so I tell them, I said, you know, if you can borrow the Fifth Guards tank army and a couple hundred T-34s to fight your way through on the ground, or enough DC-3s to drop in the 82nd Airborne and keep them supplied, yeah, this will work. Okay, otherwise you can't get there from here. The same way that you couldn't rescue Willa Manther's crew, even though you knew what was going to happen. All right. Um, so, this is sort of a reverse of the problem that they're thinking in terms of the Elizabethan technology. They're approaching the problem from the mindset of somebody who comes from a mechanized society where you can send a quick rating force around. Okay, this would be more like uh, an American Civil War cavalry raid far behind the lines. And sometimes those worked out really well, but usually not so much, okay? Operating within, say, 40, 50 miles of the front, that's one thing. You, know, you don't even want to send Grierson on a raid that deep if you expect him to get back with, with any, anybody left, okay? So you need to build a world that has the capabilities that you need in it. And hopefully you need to describe the capabilities that it has in a way that will allow the reader to follow along with what is happening, what tool set the characters have and how that tool set can be changed. Now one of the things that I believe very strongly about, and again this comes from the fact that the story, the simplest way to say it is that threat evokes response. If your opponent has a brain that works and you can do something better than he can, he will do his damnedest to figure out how to do the same thing or trump it by finding a way to do it even better. And this is why in periods of, this is why like in World War I and World War II, you saw these intense bursts of changes in war fighting technologies because all of a sudden you were up against somebody who could do it better than you could and you needed to find a way to do it even better than he could and that meant he had to find a way to do it better than you could and so weapon systems evolved very rapidly on both sides i had steve jackson come up to me steve jackson game come up to me at the convention and say i love your books because the technology changes all right and you have to be willing to let the political systems in your world do that or you do if you want to tell the kind of story I want to tell. Okay? Now, somebody who wants to tell a different kind of story may do just fine setting it in a culture as monolithic as each Egypt. Okay? Because this character is an out to change the culture. This character is out to solve a mystery in the time of Ramses. Uh, or it's a fantasy novel, and what they really need to do is to, to kill the wicked witch, you know, and, and free the, the, the captive, burn that gingerbread house to the ground, you know, etc. Um, and that's fine. I do stories like that. But even, okay, even in my, in my uh, Mazel novels, you've got these political changes taking place all along. How many of you read my novella Sword Brother in the back of the reprint of both of Swords? That's the one where I drop an LAV-25 into, into North Fresa. Uh, yeah. If you can find it, you might find it amusing.
took his adventure with uh, some gunnery sergeant uh, back to Silver Cabin and said they had these really neat weapons at the Silver Cavern Wars, I've been thinking about, let's see, pulling in the front, you know, kind of thing. So by the time I get into the main opus, those silly morphs are going to be producing muzzle loading cannon <laughs> and stuff like that, which is really not going to make the bad guys happy at all. But again, you have to understand that the dwarves in North Russia are basically Victorian England without steam. Okay, they got Bessemer converters. Okay, I described it for you, you know, for God's sake. Um, and, and so, you know, they're like, oh, I'm even toying, toying with the notion of allowing the dwarves to be experimenting with steam engines uh, by the time we get into the magnum opus, which would really make the bad guys unhappy. This is for the children. No. This is from uh, Oath of Swords, uh, War God's Own, um, Wind Rider's Oath, and yeah, the Zellin. Uh, Zellin Company. Yeah, but uh, his children. Oh, I'm sorry, I said it was a children's book. Um, is that that's not a from a wizard or something? I'm not going to tell you. Ben. <laughs> you silly, silly person. Um, but we will be doing the first volume. Uh, sometime very soon now, uh, and hopefully it will be completed within a, a year. Uh, and it will be published in the production queue. Um, and it won't really be another series because Bazel will sort of segue over into it. I promise it won't be another series. Uh, yeah, and, and that's something else. That, you know, doesn't have anything with the world. Just has to do how many series you can write. I have been nattering away, and I have actually managed to natter away for it's now two o'clock. We started at 1.30. So that means that we have about a half hour left. So yes. If when you create your universe, the hair of the rockers, yeah. we were discussing different aspects of it, and it almost seemed like it would apply to any picture. To any kind of picture of the story. What about the tech aspect? How did you go about that? What technology they had, yeah. what they didn't have? Um, well, I might as well admit that I wanted to come up with a system that would impose broadside tactics on the ship. And I want you to know that I gave it up as too much of a good thing. But in the initial tech, before I actually started writing the book, the energy weapons waste heat was disposed of by using blocks of metallic sodium around the emitters, which vaporized, which meant that you actually would have been trailing gun smoke behind. <laughs> 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 and I just said, that would have been too much of a good thing. It would have made perfectly good sense. You know, the technology would have been there. But no, <laughs> they would be so upset with me if I did that. I already got gun ports on it. You know, now I'll be that. Did you fly the thing? How? Did, he, did you suggest that? No, I never said, Jim would have said, yeah, go for it. That's why I never suggested it. I knew what he would have said. <laughs> oh, you got to put that in. I'm like, no, Jim. <laughs> um, Wouldn't that have been somewhat chemically volatile as well? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what? <laughs> yeah. well, um, it would look cool. Yeah, it would look cool. That is, you know, I could have always picked something else to vaporize, you know. Um, but the... Uh, the technology grew in part out of the tactics that I wanted to employ. The concept of hyperspace and how you get in and out of it was based on some articles that I had been reading that I decided to take certain liberties with. Um, the, um, the need for something like the Warshawski sale or the wedge really was imposed by the need to restrict firing arms. Uh, and, you know, as I looked at it and thought about it, you know, I kind of, I am not a physicist. I am simply a fairly well-read layman. And so I tried to have a foundation for what I was doing, but I didn't try to 
explain all of the physics behind it in physics students' terms. I, what I tried real hard to do was to avoid stepping on what we at this point think we know about physics. And it's kind of like I allowed myself the two things that I allowed myself in the honorverse that were like, I don't know how to do it, but sure be cool would be how you generate and manipulate gravity in the first place. And wormholes that you can actually physically transit rather than perhaps being some message or a transmission or something like that. Um, and I use the wormholes primarily as my portal in the hyperspace. Okay, or through hyperspace and folds. Uh, aside from that, the weapons grew out uh, of this is the basic uh, operational uh, regimen I want to impose and then extrapolating from current uh, generation weapons as to how like these translate into this combat environment. Uh, my real, I hate this word, but my real paradigm uh, for, for autoverse combat, this is going to sound really, really straight, was broadside armed submarines. <laughs> so if you think about it, a nuclear powered submarine is the closest we have yet to design a spaceship. It just happens to be moving into a space that is a very thick environment rather than a vacuum. And if something bad happens aboard a submarine, you're really in much the same situation you're in if something bad happens against the ship in space, except that the environment is even more hostile. Loss of structural integrity means crush, which might not happen to you, especially in micro. So there are similarities and dissimilarities. The the thing first starts back in analog back in the early 70s with a Danish submarine. Uh, they had anti-gravity that they take Mars, I don't know, there, there may have been. I know that there was one uh, in which uh, many thousand years down the road, the crew of the submarine, they'd all been killed, but they'd been killed in a sort of a way that had preserved them in stasis, and they now have this totally non-violent society that needs somebody to fight for them. They, they revive them, and they actually build in effect, a submarine for the, the, the weapons controls now, instead of controlling like, you know, 24 inch torpedoes, it's like you fire one of these suckers and it fires a multi megaton warhead missile the size of your fist, you know, kind of thing. That was kind of cool, but from a, the perspective of somebody who does military history, I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> All right, there's a book. I buy it by an Australian author in which, let's see, where do we begin? Uh, an alien starship is, an alien spaceship is discovered frozen in the Antarctic ice, guarded by albino killer leopard seals. <laughs> it turns out that there is a top secret organization in the United States which is dedicated to the seizure of all advanced technology so that it can be rationed out in a way which will best suit the, the existing power elites. There's also a matching organization in France doing the same thing for France and being unwilling to let you. Oh, and there's one in Britain. Oh, and there's one in every country. They have infiltrated the US military. We have a US Marine carrier pilot who is now in uh, U.S. Marine Special Recon Forces. Um, and it turns out that his team has been infiltrated by two members of this organization. They're sent down to rescue the Antarctic Research Station, which is near the site of this ship, after it has mysteriously gone off the air. It turns out that there is a French hunter killer team, which has already uh, moved from the uh, it goes on and on. You find out that the the, uh, the uh, signature weapon of the SAS is a liquid nitrogen grenade. And I was like, oh, excuse me. 
Uh, and it turns out eventually that the spaceship is actually uh, an aircraft built during the Nixon presidency in Antarctica so that they could avoid uh, congressional oversight and any enemy observation of what is happening. <laughs> this aircraft, which was built in the, uh, in the 1970s, uh, has been hanging upside down in its hangar. Uh, it's been upside down in its hangar for 20, 30 years. Uh, and the ice flow of the hangar on has now turned it back upright. The reason that it was okay upside down was that its vertical stabilizers, it has two of them, were frozen into the ice in the top of the hangar. Uh, the good guys, this is where we get back to, I told you, the, the Harrier pilot. Okay, the good guys escaped by flying out in this 1970s aircraft, which has been in the hangar upside down for 40 years. Uh, and nobody has to check the fuel tanks. Uh, it has a plutonium-powered nuclear reactor uh, to make its stealth systems work. Its stealth systems are much better than an F-22 has today. Uh, when they get ready to take off, they have this little problem that the vertical stabilizers are still stuck in the ice. But that's okay, they just go to afterburner and melt it. Uh, there are ice stalactites hanging from the, the roof, with the stalactites hanging from the roof of the hangar in front of them. But that's okay, because they got a Vulcan minigun. So they just fly out, firing the Vulcan minigun, and they ingest no foreign objects of any sort before they get into the air. Um, they shoot down the seven F-22s, which are somehow operating over Antarctica without any mention of, you know, intercontinental tankers or anything like that there. Um, the bad guys, the guys who have infiltrated the military, have an admiral in their employ who has come out and relieved the marine general in command of the marine amphibious ship, which has no Navy crew on board. Um, uh, and, and they're expecting this aircraft to land on it so that he can seize it. Well, it has a rotary launcher in, in the bay, and he has mastered the launch sequence for this thing well enough to shoot down all the F-22s. And before he lands, he fires off his last missile. Before he lands, the aircraft, which has no arrestor hook on an assault ship, okay, in the middle of the Antarctic Ocean, he, he fires this off. The Admiral, of course, immediately takes all the good guys off and sends them below, sends his technicians out to examine the fighter. And that's the point where you find out that the missile he launched 20 minutes before has been targeted on the flight deck of the, of the assault ship, where it destroys the aircraft without sinking the ship and without leaving any contamination behind from the plutonium in the reactor. <laughs> 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 and I hear that look around with me frequently as to how not to write. And this was the fifth novel by this guy. Okay? And I've got to think, you know, what the hell was in the others? <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this was the project. What is steel? This was the project. Oh, nice. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh, but it's kind of like, okay, how many people read Robert Wasp? <laughs> yeah, okay. We're dating ourselves. And I'm not talking about the movies, I'm talking about the books. Okay. <laughs> Let them know squat about guns. All right? He wrecks about them all the time, you know, kind of thing. But he has a scene in one of his novels where he has somebody who's armed with the 1911 45 automatic who's just been using the weapon in. Yeah combat and he's captured a bad guy in order to convince the bad guy that he really wants him to talk. There's no mention in here of setting the safety or anything else. He cocks the hammer on the HE-111. The 1911 is a single action semi-automatic, which means the hammer is already back unless he has lowered it somewhere. Okay? But he's like, apparently was confused as to whether this was a revolver or an automatic. Uh, and I was like, and, and yeah, okay, Dean Koontz, one of my favorite authors. Okay, but Dean Koontz is convinced that every Uzi anywhere in the world has a 300 round magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Which 
which is why they're very stable. They have wheels on the bottom. <laughs> and I'm convinced that one of his research assistants misplaced a decimal point. And either he's not going to go back and change it because that would take five years, was a mistake all along, or else he's just never noticed. Okay, but it's this, it's that kind of error that makes, and I'm sure I have my own version of that tucked away somewhere, but it's that kind of error that makes the reader go, how can I take anything else you said seriously? And that's what I tried real hard to avoid. That's where I was going with it. That's what I tried to avoid really hard when I set up the physics for the honor first was making that kind of mistake. One of my questions have always been, how much do those missiles cost that are fired off? Oh, they're cheap now. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. yeah because they're in such value production. Well, it's seriously, <laughs> seriously, in a way, they are, OK? You have to understand, uh, something that is not made explicit because I thought it was self-evident, OK, is these books are a post-scarcity economy. They've solved the problem of cheap, en cheap energy. I mean, think about the energy budgets in these in these starships, okay? Um, and once you've done that, and once you have gotten to the point of the type of nanotech that the universe uses, okay, once you figure out how to make it in the first place, it's not all that flippant expensive. If you can build, uh, 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 yes, ma'am? I'm oh, just reminding everybody of the 230 photo off in the lobby. I need all uniforms at the bar, and I need everybody with a camera on the second floor, okay? We're looking for the best bar, the best space station pictures. Okay. Who do I have in here in uniform? I have no uniform for ah, sitting on the floor back there. <laughs> <laughs> you guys got a, a, a trap. So they no. probably have a lot of uniforms over there. Right? Um, what was I talking about? Energy budget. Energy oh, budgets. okay. Seriously, you know, it's it's not so much the we're talking big projects here, but if you could build uh, a uh, uh, the first a seven million ton, nine million ton super dreadnought, and it only costs like thirty three billion dollars. Okay, I mean, you know, it only costs like thirty three billion dollars, but the Gerald Ford is going to cost like twelve billion and is gonna be around 100,000 tons under, you know, the close. You know, when you start looking at that and scaling it up, the missiles that were being used, okay, they're expensive for use, like if you're gonna expend them in, in practice firings, okay? But it's kind of like individual 16-inch shells weren't that expensive. But everyone you fired affected the barrel liner of the gun, which was only good for X number of rounds. And so there's there's things that put wear on the equipment. There's things that you know. and missiles are less expensive than the the, 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 the heavy bombardment missiles, the, the multi-drive missiles of, of the current point of the war, don't cost a whole heck of a lot more per unit than the single drive missiles at the start of the war did. Once you've got the line up and running, when the line goes away, boom, you got all kinds of trouble. Um, and that's one of the problems that, you know, that uh, Grand Alliance had after Operation Western, which had nothing at all to do with Pearl Harbor. Uh, <laughs> How did you decide on economics of the future and, and like for trade, what is like the gold standard? Okay, uh, if you read uh, the, uh, we've actually seen more of it in uh, the books that I've done with uh, Eric, where you see how the currency is, is what the currency is based on, uh, the hard currency. Um, Essentially, I decided that since I had come up with counter gravity, getting stuff out of the gravity well was going to be dirt cheap then. And that meant that interstellar commerce, as opposed to simply interstellar transmission of information, became plausible. And that being the case, I decided that they probably would go for economies of scale. Okay, there's Jerry Cornell said many years ago. 
living at the bottom of the gravity well has accustomed us to think small. All right? You know, nine million tons is not all that flippin' big for something that you're gonna build in space. Okay, in fact, I had to put a limit on the top of tonnage based on the technology available for moving the ships under impeller drive and whatnot. Uh, now, the merchant ships run between about 2 million tons and about 4 million, 6 million is a real biggie. And the reason for that is that they're sized to their roots. If you look at like uh, an old large crude carrier today, you've got ships that are pushing a half million tons on the water, okay? So, you know, if you're going to transport grain over an interstellar distance, then you might as well transport enough of it to make it worthwhile for everybody involved. And it means that the quantity that you're transporting doesn't have to be that expensive when it gets to the other end. It's not like you're transporting spices from Cathay uh, around the Cape of Good Hope, okay? Um, so I assumed that the commerce would operate in what for the honorverse would be relatively short trade routes normally, you know, about 100 light years. Okay, <coughs> that's where the wormhole junctions start coming in because you can tie these short sections to each other. And then the Nantes begin building the real long haul freighters and so forth. Um, and you have a post scarcity economy, but there are some things. You notice that there are a lot of ships in the universe that are carrying around grain or beef or. <coughs> okay, these are the products that you can have all the energy you want, okay, and still, you know, getting a load of oatmeal requires somebody to grow the oats and transport the oats around. There are other commodities that it's cheaper to, to buy somewhere else and have shipped in. Uh, the main problem in the universe isn't the cost of energy, it isn't the cost of material, it's the cost of the sophistication of the equipment needed to start up. And that's why a lot of the merge planets are as uh, well, that, that they have, they have, um, their, their tech is retrograde, is because they didn't have the skill set or the equipment to set up to begin with. They've been lost for a while. Their technology is set backwards. The colony was established, but it didn't have anything to attract more people to it, to bring in later increments of technology, et cetera. Uh, but very few people, in, that, that one of the problems that the Haymanites have is that they ought to be able to provide a decent standard of living for all of their citizens because of the inherent capabilities of their technology. But they don't have the, the base of population and skill sets to do it because of the way their system has constrained their society. If you understand, that, you understand. Does that answer your question? Uh, pretty much. I was just thinking, knowing how you have to set the universe and it's well, one thing for a planet, but there's so many planets. Yeah. Well, and, and the various planets, you know, they, this one, you can set it up on the basis of what does this planet supply that makes it worthwhile for them to have interstellar commerce? What's the one good they do? You can have it set up on the basis of this is a diversified economy that the ship has been blown, you know, uh, 5,000 tons of computers to drop off and so and so on its way through. Molly certs are still expensive uh, unless you're growing your own for your, for your business technology or whatever. Uh, so take that along, and they all they also have the you know the Midwest growing you know a bazillion bushels of corn, and they need that on planet so and so. That's the next one. You can do it that way, which is actually probably a more realistic model. Or you can do it on the model of the, of the petroleum industry, where the ship hauls one thing that is necessary 
to go to the other event. Or you could take the position that there probably won't be much in the way of interstellar commerce because of the distances involved and so forth. That a planet is a big thing. It can produce most of what its, its civilization, the people living on it, need. Or a solar system. Or a solar system. So you can take whatever models are going to work best for your story and, and work it in. In the case of the universe, I needed there to be a maritime power. And that presupposed a merchant marine for the maritime power to exist. In your world building for the universe, at some point you decided you needed a consultant to nine. Uh, at what point was that? Actually, that wasn't what happened. V9 contacted me uh, and started, you know, and basically what happened sorry, was sorry, you're good. He said, uh, you've been sort of, you know, pulling stuff together and we wanted to ask you if we got this right. Uh, and I, they started out as fans. Yeah. Uh, and, and what happened was, it's not that I need V9 even then. Okay, is that the United is such an enormous help sure. that I can sit down, these are guys that I can sit down with who know every single thing about the nuts and the bolts, and I can be talking to them, and they will tell you that the most terrifying moment in a conversation with these guys, suddenly stop going, ooh, shiny! Okay, because that means I just had an idea, and they're like, oh, Lord, what's going to happen now? And, you know, and then we're off to the races. I say, what if we did this, if we did that, we did that? Where would that impact on this? And Tom will go, well, let me check, you know, and they say, okay, that would have an effect here and here. And I'm like, now let's think about it there. It would have this effect right here. going on. And I say, well, what's it going to do over there? And say, well, see, you could pinch on this, et cetera, et cetera. So they give me this invaluable sounding board that, that, I can, that I can work with. And Tom actually has developed a lot of the tech for the um, uh, Travis Long novels that Tim Tom was doing with me in the honorers for 300 years earlier. And I'm hoping that we can transfer some of that 300 years earlier tech to the Grayson fleet of the movie to give a very distinctively different feel because the Graysons have had to kind of build it on their own and so forth. So their weapon systems and their tactics are going to be more primitive. They're going to be closer to what Travis Long's period was familiar with, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and so I can use some of this. Nobody told them that something wouldn't work, so they went ahead and did it anyway. Yeah, pretty much. Well, that, and that's happened in, in our own history. Yeah. Um, another question. Yeah. At Demicon, you said that if you were going to start the Honorverse over again now, you would change a couple of things. No. What were those things that you would change? Well, the computer technology would be substantially different uh, in a lot of ways. See, yeah, people are like, well, oh, Weber's a dinosaur, he's the ideas of computer technology are 20 years out of date. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> when I established the baseline for the computers of the universe, everybody was 20 years out of date from where they are right now. <laughs> yeah, so give me a break. Um, I deliberately set the universe up to not use neural interfaces. I had done that in Mutineer's Moon. I had done that in Path of the Fury. In uh, the Starfire books with Steve White, even voice, voice communication was an impossibility, which I would still go far to some extent because of the ability, the sensitivity of the software to the stress of combat on the human voice. Okay, I'm, you're going to have to convince me. It's kind of like you got to tell me where the waste heat's going with the nanites before I'll really buy into all the neat stuff that they can do. Uh, with the voice activated, you have to convince me that the, the software is going to be good enough to understand somebody whose normal, normal base voice has turned into a falsetto uh, because of the, the, what's, hap what's coming towards him at that moment. Um, and, and, you know, oh my God, <laughs> the computer says, excuse me, Dave, I didn't understand it. Oh, I didn't understand it. <laughs> uh, I didn't understand it. Never mind. <laughs> you know, there could be problems here. 
In the honor verse, I started to go with uh, voice activated computers and neural uh, connectivity. And I decided not to because I wanted it in other stories I've been doing at that point. I wanted it to be different enough that it wasn't going to bleed over onto it, if you see what I'm saying. Um, there are a couple of other things that I might want to do uh, in terms of uh, medical technology and so forth. But one of the problems with long series is that your world building should better be should, should be good at the beginning because you're stuck with it. You can modify it in terms of evolving technology, but you can't modify it in terms of the underlying physics assumptions uh, and so forth. And so, you know, the underlying physics assumption in the universe was that neural interfacing doesn't work for 2,000 years from now. We have it. Now, I happen to think that 50 years from now, we have it. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure I want it. Uh, all right. I mean, the last thing I need is for Google to be keeping track of the keystrokes in my brain, you know, and shopping it around. Uh, but I think that the technology is probably much closer to within our reach than a lot of people would assume. Um, could be wrong, too. I mean, the one thing that nobody, nobody in the 1950s and the 1940s saw coming uh, was the printed circuit and, and uh, modern computers. I mean, Doc Smith has his, his astrogators using slide rules. Uh, and, and so, you know, yes, and uh, Two things. First of all, your wife is on her way in. She is not? Or she, she is on her way in. She yes, she said 15 minutes. minutes. And the second thing is that they're actually doing a photograph of all of the government people in uniform. Yes. And Evergreen is leaving shortly. So you might want to come out and say um, where are we on? Here, not <laughs> um, Well, we're actually we're right at the end of our 130 panel, right? And I have another one in the same room. Okay. Yep, in a half hour. In a half hour. Okay, I do need to go tell the Evergreen guys goodbye. And if Sharon's here, I probably should say hello. Might be. Yes. Can I get you to stick this back in the box? Yeah.